Muy bien, ya estamos por empezar nuestra siguiente plática. Ya estamos por arrancar con Mari. Esta plática va a ser en inglés hasta donde tenemos entendido. Entonces prepárense, cambien su mindset a inglés. Let's switch to English. Uh, we are inviting at this moment a uh, Mari and she's connecting right now. Hello, Mari. Hello, Sanu. Sanu, how do I say your name? <laughs> Don't worry, you can say Sier. Sier. Okay. Hello. Yeah, don't worry. Nobody knows how to pronounce my name. Nobody. <laughs> Even my wife. Oh. <laughs> so, hello, Mari. Mari, for everyone uh, to know her, uh, she's a senior developer advocate at IBM. Uh, she has experience with C, with Unix. Also, she has experience with open source, cloud. She's getting into reactive programming and also she's getting into mobile. That's something that I like because I am an Android awesome developer. And she's also a, one of the organizers, presidents of the Java User Group of Chicago, right? That's right. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Awesome. So, yeah. So okay. yeah, having having Mari with with us here today is an honor. We are honored mm -hmm. of having you here. Uh, she will be talking to us in this amazing time about. Tears quenching streams for the reactive mind. This is Thank an you. interesting topic. Reactive is getting Thank very interesting. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so Mari, this is your stage. Oh, thank so you. Anything okay. you need, I will be on the background, but okay. it's thank your time. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay, let me share my screen and uh, I guess. Okay. 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 So, uh, close message, like, let me see. Okay, can everybody see? Wait, uh, close on marriage. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? I think I uh, just want to make sure. Um, okay, let me maximize it. Okay, all right, great. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, on this Saturday, uh, coming to my talk. Um, I named my talk, Thirst Quenching Streams for the Reactive Mind, um, and also actually a subtitle, It's actually a talk on streams as they pertain to the reactive world. I mean, as such, right? Let me kind of give a bit of an you know intro of myself first. So again, thank you, Sir, for giving me you know such a great uh, welcome and introduction. So I won't need to say too much. Yeah, but I do want to also invite you because now you know with the COVID pandemic, amazingly, there's some one good side effect is the world is coming closer together through the internet. Um, and also like for us, right? we're developers, um, we are very much like social beings, uh, we want to be together. This has been great because I'm a Chicago Java Users Group uh, president and I have been organizing a lot of meetups on many different topics. And as you know, in Java, there's like an infinite number of possibilities. Uh, we can't accommodate everybody's needs, but we try and also a lot of the emerging technologies is what we're focusing on for presentation topics. Also, too, we have uh, we're trying to also start up some life coding things um, too, and like study groups and things like that. So you are all welcome to join too. So I'll give you some information later. But otherwise, you can search for us on Meetup.com. Uh, search for Chicago Java Users Group, so you can find us. But anyway, so that's enough about me. So back to the talk. So the talk, you know, as such, right? When we talk about streams these days, everybody is thinking of oh well, we stream something on you know our movie to watch things and they are stream and um, and also like, you know, streams can mean many things. But the thing is, um, in this case, we're focusing on the reactive side of things. Uh, for reactive, it's very much an event-driven uh, programming paradigm that we're talking about. The systems and everything are concurrent processing. So streams are like the, the way how data is being like structure, if you want to, if I may say so, structure. And as such, you know, streams are not as structured as the traditional way of programming. So, so today, talk is actually on streams per pertaining to the reactive side of things. So bear with me a second, I'll switch. So let me, um, I have to also, first of all, assume a bit of a, you know, kind of everybody on the common the page. So if you are already familiar with reactive programming, I apologize, you know, this may be a bit of a basic, some things I'll be covering a bit of a basic concepts because also I, I'm guessing a lot of folks too may not have already done any uh, reactive work. So I'm gonna be 
having you know having some kind of uh, basic uh, information in here too. So and also you can tell me too on this chat. You know if you are like um, like more advanced uh, or you are you know your experience level with reactive, I would also like to know. Um, and but again, this one is a bit more. Um, I mix in some basic concepts first. So let me start. So essentially, when we talk about reactive and also particularly uh, as it pertains to the Java world, we have you know reactive programming, reactive systems, and now also this uh, specification called reactive streams. And when I searched to when I first started working on reactive uh, this uh, area, it was new to me about I'd say a, a year and a half ago or so when I first joined IBM, I was told to do some reactive uh, like efficacy. So, and and as I'm finding is that on the internet, there's just so many, so much information, so it can be confusing too. And I also have to emphasize, it is a bit of a paradigm shift too, if you want to go the reactive route. And to me, the biggest advantage of it is that it helps with like event-driven programming, asynchronous uh, way of processing without you having have to go in and deal with the threats. So very, you know, as, as such, right, this we're talking about concurrency. You know, we're processing data in concurrency mode. And, uh, and as such, you know, it sounds simple, but we know if you have done thread programming, it can become quickly become chaotic because you have to manage different streams of, you know, activity going on at the same time. You need to synchronize them somehow. Um, you need to make use of threads. It's never very easy. So that's the idea, reactive coming in and it will, that simplify your your uh, dealing with not having to deal with threats. Now, the thing is, it's not like completely threat free. And that's another thing, right? Because people might be saying that, well, you know, we're already having all these clustering and all these things, they're already doing the job and, you know, threats and, you know, like, why do we do reactive? The thing is that, you know, the what it is giving you is that there's a performance improvement there, because now the threading is being moved to user space instead of Traditionally, right, when computer has um, only like single core machine, you know, it used to be easier, right? Before, before all the multi core comes out, multi CPU, all of these things. Um, basically, the software systems was easier to deal with because everything your thread is happening in kernel space on your kernel thread. But at the same time, if you can look at it, when you do kernel like threading, the I/O, you know, every time you do something, then you will hold up the thread. So that's the that's the drawback of it. But now we are moving all the threads, being the libraries, implementing them in user space. Then it becomes more efficient. It doesn't hold up the main thread in your kernel space. So that's that's one thing. So again, let me kind of start now. And so reactive programming, I wanted to point out that's not the same as reactive systems. Um, programming, when we talk about it, is really we're programming on the on like a single component level. We are dealing with reactive programming. There are some techniques that that we have to uh, work with. So let's take a look. I'm borrowing this slide too from Reactive Extension Rx. They have a marble diagram. So if you are new to it, um, I just thought this would be a good way of describing when we deal with reactive programming. We're talking about programming using streams. So um, this is like a way of expressing it, you know, in straight line. So very, very top one is like stream. There's no data on it. The second line in here, it's basically the, the streams and you have different marbles and these represent like events. Events itself carry with the data. So this is kind of like a simplistic way of just describing it. You know, in reality, you will have, you know, the stream and there are different data and many streams as well and many sets of data coming in. So as you can see, it can, quickly become like unruly if you don't manage it, you know, accordingly. But anyway, back to this reactive programming. So over here, the perpendicular perpendicular line in this second stream, it means the stream has terminated. And then the third one here is there's an X. So what it, it represents the X here is actually an error event. So in reactive programming, even errors are being treated as first class citizen. So events come in, it will tell you, is it you know a normal event or error? So in reactive programming, you have to handle it accordingly too. And then the bottom one is basically streams with like a, an open-ended stream. You, you basically are waiting to have you know more and more data coming in. There's no termination in this case. So and let's take a little bit deeper look. And I'm borrowing the reactive, again, the reactive RX um, marble diagram. And if you're familiar with Rx Java, Rx JavaScript, now Rx came from, um, essentially came actually from Microsoft. Uh, that's when uh, .NET come out with the reactive uh, 
you know, kind of this approach reactive extension. And then Netflix uh, saw the potential of it and then ported it to Java. That was back in early 2010, 2012, about that time frame. So that's when Rx Java first came out. And it's become very popular. And um, its use has been widely adopted by like, uh, you know, Android uh, mobile developers too, as you may be aware. So anyway, so, so take an example. So a uh, very common usage will be using, you know, we, when we talk about streams, when we program a, asynchronous events, we're talking about data coming in, we need to transform the data. So in this case, map is a very common uh, kind of operator. You operate on the data using this map, essentially it's functional style. So this becomes also kind of timely too with, you know, with uh, the Java JVM, uh, the, the Java 8, right, that comes in with streams, with lambdas and everything, functional style of programming. So that's kind of coincide real well. But anyway, over here, so using a dot uh, map operator, uh, this and a quick example is if you do this and you specify your function, right, it's like doing math, you know, you, you kind of have your uh, variable coming in and you have a function that tells it what to do, it transforms it. In this particular case, it multiplies itself by 10. So over here in code form and in Rx Java, if we're calling it an observable, that's in Rx Java 1, by the way. And then Rx Java 2 is flowable because Rx Java 2 has back pressure support. And so this one too, an example is, you know, observable.just, basically you read in your input stream. So in this case, the data is one, two, and three. And then you apply a map like transformer to it. You transform the data. And what you do is you multiply all of the data by 10 and it applies to all the you know, occurrences of these data on this stream, then you immediately do a subscribe. So what it does is it subscribe is basically you subscribe to some data that will that will happen in the future. It doesn't when you do the subscribe, when you code it, it execute doesn't happen right away. Of course, this is a simple example It's probably happened in a split second. But in some heavier processing, right, you are doing many, you know, your transformer, you have very multiple, you know, layers of transformer, you're filtering some data, like a huge set of terabytes of data, you'll be doing filtering, doing, you know, this flat mapping it and all these things and merging and all that, they will take some time. So if you do a subscribe, the subscribe actually is subscribing to something, the data that will happen in the future. So that's, I want to kind of point out too. But in this simple case, all it does is it prints it out, the, the, um, the result to the, the output to like timber.d, so I printed out to the, the standard, uh, you know, the output basically it's console. So in here, in this case, you see output of 10, 20, and 30. So if you want to get more information on this, you can always visit rxmarbles.com and that will give you, uh, you know, some exercise you can do interactively too, if you haven't already done so. So for example, I mentioned about filter, that will be also another uh, popular uh, usage of a transform transforming like operator in that case. So. And there, there are many of them. And also um, later too, I'll be talking about the Spring Reactor too. If you're working with Spring Project Reactor, that's also their uh, reactive library that has all the operators as well. So, okay. And okay, let me switch to other. Okay, so now I, so that was a very quick, you know, uh, introduction of reactive programming. Again, it's not the same as reactive systems. Uh, let me tell you why, because reactive systems, it makes use of all of these uh, reactive way of doing things in your individual components, but the system basically bring this to a different level. You're dealing with many components and essentially too, um, they are all have to somehow have a way of interacting with one another synchronously, kind of that is uh, kind of uh, approach. But let me also then bring to your attention. So reactive and also now we're also talking about streams there's also kafka streams for example uh, spark streams all these things but reactive streams and the reactive manifesto reactive manifesto is what we are referring to um, that should be the guiding principles for reactive systems so in this case the four there are four uh, tenets of the reactive manifesto and the reactive manifesto by the way is kind of was being initiated by the folks at lightband and used to be type safe they are the folks that invented scala um, and essentially too, they have defined this uh, uh, like kind of a set of guiding principles and they have determined like four principles that are necessary in order for a systems to be declared like reactive. So in this case, first and foremost, responsive. Responsive is essentially you want, um, 
you know, that your system, if you have any requests going in, you want it to respond uh, quickly. Yeah, like, you know, it doesn't mean like right away, kind of like no time, but it's basically it's a reasonable time is being means by responsive. And then if you want to um, go further, then if there are problems that happens with your system, it also needs to be very resilient and it needs to be able to recover it quickly or maybe handle, you know, the error needs to be handled accordingly. Also very responsive uh, way of dealing with uh, the, the failure. So that's resiliency and recoverability. And so now with this too, uh, if you think of in today's world, when we're dealing with huge set of data, big data, especially like in application area, like uh, AI, machine learning, you're crunching like a set of, you know, huge sets of uh, petabyte, petabyte of data or something. Then the thing is too, your system, you know, anytime it needs to be able to respond to the load really quickly. And um, say, for example, right, um, reactive systems too, this approach can be used in a, uh, an e-commerce uh, scenario. If let's say, um, uh, you know, a flowers shop, you know, flowers.com, for example, um, you order flowers. So can you imagine like on the day right before Valentine's Day, a lot of gentlemen would be ordering flowers, right? Or just not just gentlemen too, but everybody ordering flowers. So you see a huge spike in that. So you need your system to be able to respond quickly. All of the processor that are processing all of these online orders and the orders too will also have to go to like your credit card company to do, you know, all the payment and everything. And also then they also have to notify your supplier and then delivery, all these things. So that means that the system needs to be very, uh, respond to the load really uh, quickly. So the elasticity is a required um, kind of uh, principle inside of re reactive systems too. So this means it has to be very scalable and the performance should not degrade is the goal. So, okay, so all these, like the three things we talk about now, we go to uh, message driven. So by message driven is basically the mechanism that enables all three of these responsiveness, resiliency and elasticity to happen. Um, it's essentially meaning your all of your components, they are not tightly coupled. So there are some ways do they need to be able to uh, talk with each other very efficiently. So you need like a message driven uh, capability. And actually it's also a bit of a um, point to point out is that there's, there's event driven message and also message driven. So the difference is that in a message driven case is that the, the messages has a known address that it should be going to. So very often, for example, in Akka, right? Akka is the light band uh, reactive uh, framework. And so they, they actually have an actor model. So those are message driven systems that basically uh, the, the sender and receiver, they are like two mailboxes. They keep sending in, you know, it, messages to each other and they know the messages are going to each other kind of back and forth. Now, event driven is slightly different. It, the thing is with event driven is that the messages, it's like a pop sub system, right? You publish your messages and then whoever is interested, you subscribe to it. And that's like event driven. It's more like, you know, you have some, some message you go out and the publisher will just kind of emits the message, kind of like announcing it. So it's up to those who are interested will subscribe to it. So that's event driven. But anyway, I spent enough time on this slide. So I'll move on to the next one. So some words too about concurrency and parallelism. So when it comes to reactive streams, we are really dealing with like concurrent concurrency in systems. So just uh, something to point out is that concurrent uh, jobs are meaning that you want to be able to deal with multiple tasks at once, but it doesn't mean that all of the tasks are being um, executed uh, at the same time. So it depends on your hardware too. So it just gives you this impression, you know, to us who are not dealing with the underneath the hood thing, they are just, you know, all these tasks are being handling uh, concurrently. But they, you know, as such too, you have like, you know, one processor that actually in this case in the old style would be, you know, you're, you have to like all the threads have to like switch between the different processor to actually handle the concurrency um, in that case. But for parallelism, it does require your heart to have hardware, let's say multi-core hardware today. So basically you are really truly handling multiple tasks all at once because you have multi, you know, different cores that are handling or multi CPU machines that are handling different tasks at the same time. So that I just wanted to point out. And uh, let's then go to the next thing. Uh, so why was why would it be important? Because um, the thing is with reactive systems. So now I bring in these uh, reactive architecture design patterns too. There there are actually many patterns too. Um, if you're new to it, I just want to point out a few that are more that you will encounter more commonly. So there's uh, for example, actually I wanted to say um, first maybe the back pressure. 
So back pressure, essentially, too, it's a very common uh, kind of techniques that we will need to be applying uh, to a reactive systems. The reason is you can have, you know, many requests coming in again. You know, then if you can kind of think of, you know, you many requests coming in, if you do not um, have enough processor to process it, so then that creates like a back pressure scenario. So basically, it's sort of like backfire. You're trying to send requests down, but basically, too, there are errors. So that actually all of these error events could kind of push back to, you know, the, the, the one that's the source of it. So, so essentially, too, a reactive systems also would have to have mechanism of handling this back pressure. Okay. And then, um, there's also uh, circuit breaking. So circuit breaking is like when error occurs, you don't want the error to persist throughout the system. So there should be mechanism in which that particular error scenario needs to be handled like separately. So it breaks away from the whole system. It's much like your physical, if you're into like physics, right? Electronics, you're, you know what it is, right? It's circuit. So essentially a circuit breaking mechanism in the, on the software uh, level. So, and then there are also CQRS and event sourcing you might have also heard of too, or work already work with it. So event sourcing is just a new way of uh, handling your data. So then um, you're you know in a in a running system. So you all of your events are actually being captured. So it enables. So in that case, what it means is that maybe there's there's actually no need to be storing the state of of your system of certain data because what happened is that you're capturing the events. So the events itself already has information about the changes in the state of your piece of data throughout, you know, like a log file, for example. So the thing is, the idea is that you have event sourcing. So anytime you need to go back, you can always apply um, like a replay kind of sequence, you know, replay kind of mechanism to kind of go through and replay it. And then you can kind of construct what, you know, the, the state of your data is going through. So that's event sourcing. And it's also commonly used in a reactive systems. Um, uh, as such. And then there's also CQRS, and that I won't have time to go into all the detail here, but it's basically, it's a command query uh, responsibility segregation. It's basically, you want to separate out the write API and the read API to your data source. Um, so that's also a, like a, a techniques that's being applied, you know, in the reactive system space. And then there are also many other, uh, uh, you know, design patterns that are associated with reactive systems too. I'll have a link towards the end of the slide that, um, and I will give this slide, uh, you, know, you know, to your organizer. So you can also uh, reference that website. It's actually written by somebody from like then too. And it's very detailed design or discussion of all the patterns. So, okay. Now, let me then kind of get into the stream side now. So again, with reactive programming, reactive systems, reactive, this reactive world, we're dealing with streams. So in reality too, we want to take a look into the different models of how streams are being um, modeled after. So there's this idea of the push versus pull kind of concept. So push as it here is basically upstream, upstream data. So essentially uh, it's like messaging, right? If you work with a Java messaging system, you know, PubSub and JMS, and basically there's pu publisher and subscriber. So the, the ones that's kind of publish the data is like we call upstream. So that actually will push the data to downstream. And that we also calling it, um, uh, a, another word to describe it is a hot observable. So basically it's a bit more like, you know, a proactive type of uh, model because data comes and it's basically will push the data to downstream. And then the pool is basically the downstream is pulling data from upstream and that's, we describe it like a cold observable. It's a bit more like lazy kind of way of doing things. It's like, okay, I need stuff and I won't, you know, do anything until I need it. And then, you know, basically, you know, you have a pull. And so basically what is happening now is that you pull it, you kind of signal it to the source. So then when it, the data is ready, the data will get be pushed by the upstream down kind of like that. So, okay. Some more uh, kind of, um, you, this would be a diagram to describe, right? So a push model is basically producer emits data and then it sends it to the consumer without being asked explicitly in this case. So it emits data, but in, actually in some certain, certain cases in which this consumer will actually need to subscribe. So that would be like the uh, pool, the, the next diagram, which is the pool is the downstream will initiate and then pulls from the upstream when it is ready. So in this, this case, right, you can see the consumer basically needs data. It actually will do a pull. So it, if you look into the code earlier with Rx uh, reactive extension is basically if you do a subscribe and that's what is happening, consumer will indicate its needs for the data doing a dot subscribe. 
And then when the producer is ready, then it will emit the data and it knows then at that point, the future data will actually uh, know that it, it's going to have to be delivered to the consumer who has kind of subscribed to it. Okay, and um, okay, then now I see another just picture of describing back pressure earlier. Uh, but I think it's probably better to kind of describe it this way is basically back pressure is like you got publisher publishing all of the data like all at once. In this case, it's like a shower, right? You're trying to have water um, going to your subscriber, but it's coming too fast. So the subscriber basically is overwhelmed. So it publishes too much data than subscriber. So that's just a diagram to describe back pressure. Okay. So now then let's uh, kind of go into talking about a bit more in the code level. So we're back to talking about reactive streams now. And uh, reactive streams is, again, a uh, specification that's come out uh, based on uh, the Flow API of Java 9. And basically, right now, too, there's also a, a foundation that's been spun off of the Linux foundation called uh, Reactive Foundation. So if you're not familiar, that's reactivefoundation.org uh, or .com. And I have the link to back then. So basically, too, this uh, reactive streams um, is a specification, and all it has are four interfaces. And, but don't be fooled by it. <laughs> you know, you feel like, oh, well, only four interfaces is simple. No, because now we're talking about reactive streams being specific, you know, like some standard being applied to it. But it's actually quite complicated because it is dealing with back pressure, is dealing with threats, and all these other things underneath the hood. But the nice thing is that we, in general, do not have to worry about it. Because reactive streams, too, you also may not want to do it directly yourself. So again, there are four interfaces. It doesn't have any implementation, just kind of more like you know these are the interfaces. So it's basically intended for a service provider uh, to provide their interfaces. So their SPI, right, service provider interface. So I'll be then going into um, a few like popular libraries that implement that. But the thing is, we don't want to encourage you to directly, right? If, if you are like an application uh, developer, because all of these complicated things are a bit of a lower level uh, concern that it should be handled by all the libraries, dealing with all of the streams and back pressure and managing them, their concurrency. So that's why all of the libraries are there to serve us you know, better. So we don't need to worry about it. But let's also, it, it's still good though, right? We need to understand it too. So let's take a quick look. Okay, so reactive streams, these are the Java interfaces. Again, it's based on Java 9, the Flowable, the Flow API on uh, Java 9. And so, a uh, Flowable, right? Yeah, so anyway, so this too, we have a publisher. So publisher has a method is subscribe and then uh, our method interface and subscriber has on subscribe, on next, on error and on complete. So it's basically dealing of your, dealing with your subscriber and then on subscribe, it, pass in the subscription. And there's also, then it, it will kind of process, right, all of your streams that's coming in on next, and then they're on error and on complete. And then there's also subscription. So subscription is more of an abstract thing because it will, um, it essentially is, is what you have um, uh, connect like a subscriber to a publisher that becomes like a subscription. So it's an abstract kind of description of that particular subscription between a subscriber and a publisher. And so over here is also subscription is also where the back pressure is being applied there. And over there, there are requests. The request is where it will, you know, it manages all of the back pressure in here. There are requests that are coming in and then you can also cancel your subscription. And then there's also processor. So processor basically uh, will extend your subscriber and publisher is basically specified, you know, how the, the, the stream processing is supposed to happen. Okay, now, then let's get more than into this reactive streams. And basically, a um, uh, quick thing is that th this is the package name, org.reactivestreams, that's the API. And that's specifications only, and there are no implementations. So if any SPI, right, service provider uh, interface, right, company that vendors want to, wants to implement it, they have to press uh, or pass the um, technology compatibility kit testing. So they, have to, they do have a TCK too. And the idea of having reactive streams is important in the sense that we want to promote interoperability. So over here, right, we, I'm listing out these are uh, example of libraries that implement these uh, reactive streams. So first foremost, right, Spring, Reactor, and Rx, I grouped them together because 
they are essentially the same group of uh, engineers that work on both projects. Uh, David Kanoff is the one leading that. And then there's also Vertex uh, is a uh, Eclipse open source project, Vertex. And then there's uh, Lightband, uh, their Arca streams, and then also Microprofile. Now Microprofile is a Eclipse foundation project. It also um, is kind of catered more for microservices too, but it also um, support uh, micro uh, support reactive uh, messaging, reactive streams too. And it's also um, support also have a very good integration with Open Liberty, uh, as you may know, or maybe some of you. Open Liberty is the the uh, uh, open source version of the IBM WebSphere. Um, so that's also quite uh, good. And also then there's also a new thing, newer kind of library called RSocket, which I'll also touch upon. So I just want to point out all these five. So now back to the interoperability interoperability um, aspect of it. So if you have a, a you know a um, specification that tells it what your source and your um, you know sync kind of source and destination should act, right? So you're basically coding and you're coding Let's say I'm doing like a reactor way of dealing with data coming in and coming out. And basically, if you know, if it conforms to the to, to a spec, then you basically can have your application built, you know, making being made up of many different substreams. So these streams are all independently operated. They they can be, you know, in spring um, in the reactor or in a, a vertex uh, in that particular segment of your whole pipeline. And even Kafka stream, streams too, you can also like have that kind of connect with it. Now my talk that goes beyond this talk, but the thing is there's also very good kind of in integration too between uh, reactive streams uh, implementation and also Kafka stream, streams. So think about it, right? Now, you know, in reality, in our company, we are not dealing with fancy, you know, uh, systems very often. And even I myself, I was an application developer for a while. Um, before that, I was actually with Sybase. Was, I worked on the JEE, at the time, J2EE server development. Then I spent you know, 12 years in, when I came to Chicago, I was in application um, space. And I recognized the pain. Because very often, if you go into you know, a company, you're not handed something to say, well, build this from scratch. It's always, it's, I think, um, majority is, you are given some old system. Maybe even like IBM old mainframe thing, right? MVS, I have done that. And they were basically telling me, I have a calendar system. I need to you to be able to send data over to MVS, you know, at, yeah, kind of at, at a bank, you know, major bank. So, you know, those kind of things, like you're dealing with old stuff. You, you basically, we are Java developer. We are excited about new things. What do you mean? You know, you come in, you give me old stuff. What am I going to do with it? But guess what? That's the beauty with reactive streams, for example, you can be creative because you can basically look at your old thing and say, well, can we kind of encapsulate, make it like, you know, it deals with its own stuff, but there is some interface that it can deal with the input output data. And basically I can sort of like design it around it using define this thing as a reactive stream source and destination, but basically plug that in as a reactive streams kind of connecting piece into the rest of your system and basically you know, if, if you can do something like that, I think, it, you know, the, the opportunities are limitless. I think we are only touching, scratching the surface of how to do applications um, more creatively and more like making use of all of these modern infrastructure and capability more efficiently. I think the potential is limitless. I'm here to do this talk. I don't know the answer yet, but I see this possibility. So I'm kind of excited. I want to kind of share this with you and maybe you can also you know get creative thinking of can I actually make use of a uh, reactive streams can I do this right and this is nice the inter interoperability part you can build new stuff and basically they can all be connected you know they are all interoperable as long as you follow these uh, streams so anyway so that's just my kind of thinking that's something I'm also like as I'm doing this more and more I feel that it's not just rigidly doing our job. We can be creative, taking what it is and kind of make it kind of new ways of doing things. So that's my thing. All right, so let me then very quickly go through this before I kind of show you some example code. But again, you know, I talk about Spring Reactor um, that's come from Pivotal. I should actually say VMware. Um, so essentially to you be making use, you know, Spring, Spring Reactor is actually, actually there's Spring Web Flux, which is the web framework, as I'm sure a lot of you may know. If you're familiar with Spring MVC, it's kind of like a natural progression if you want to go reactive, is to use the Spring 
uh, WebFox. And basically, Spring Reactor to make use of their project uh, reactor, which is their library of the reactive library that implements the reactive strings. And so you can kind of use that. And so um, essentially, there is Flux, right? And Flux deals with like zero to to like multi you know items in the streams. And then there's also Mono is zero to one. So, and just again, just wanted to point out to you. I won't have time to go into each, so I just kind of highlight all of these things. Now, Reactive Extension, Rx Java, I mentioned earlier, which I already talked about, is uh, an API for asynchronous programming with observable streams. So that's the link to it. And basically, we're dealing with flowables now in the Rx Java 2, which has back pressure support. And in fact, um, I my example, actually, I have a Vertex example. And Vertex also integrates very well to with Rx Java. It has the integration. So I'll also kind of quickly show you. So all of these things, you can kind of like all have integration uh, level to kind of work with each other. So. And uh, so I won't say as much because I already talked about uh, reactive extension more. That's uh, Rx Java is ported by Netflix in 2012, 2013 timeframe. And uh, since then, it's become you know very popular for Android apps too. And then there's Vertex. And now um, again, you know all of these libraries. By the way, they are all open source. And company I work for, IBM, we are into we are advocating for open source, and that's the way to go. You know, everybody can also contribute and participate. So, Eclipse Foundation is the one that where Vertex is uh, kind of the project is kind of being like managed under uh, by the independent uh, open source group. And it's a reactive framework. It makes use of verticals. Uh, it has its own very efficient like event bus. And it has its own runtime as well. So I will also won't say much now because I, I, I think I only have about maybe 10 minutes or so. So I want to show you an example shortly. And then there's also Arca Streams. It comes from Lightband. So Arca Streams completely decouple from the reactive streams interface, but don't be fooled by it because underneath the hood, they are still implementing their uh, or yeah implementing their reactive streams. But basically, too, from from the application programmer's perspective, you are using Arca Streams. Then they have like different um, different like not like directly calling you know your publisher or subscriber and all that stuff, but they all, they have like a flow, and then they also have a sync, and basically they manage it slightly differently. And Akka too is always kind of come out with um, its own way of doing things because it's also built on top of their actor model, which is very efficient too, very um, kind of interesting, right, from messaging perspective. And it's an API that is minimal and consistent, and it's basically very explicit and over, they call it like not magic and compositionality. So basically combining different pieces and retaining functionality of each part. And there are also toolings, right? Back pressure buffering and all these things. And also with Arca Streams, there's also an Alpaca that's actually more of an integrator connector. You can connect different sources to with the Arca Streams using Alpaca as well. So um, I have an example with Arca too, but I do not think I would have time to show, but maybe hopefully in the future time. And so now uh, micro profile. So micro profile also uh, implements the reactive streams and the focus on it on that is mainly on microservices, although it's not just limited to microservices, but in today's world, in our systems modernization, we are actually very much focusing on microservices. So it's highly relevant in this case. And also want to also me, which I did not mention, I think earlier is that microservices is actually um, and reactive style, reactive systems, they kind of go hand in hand together real well because both are emphasizing on the systems that's not tightly coupled. So both are kind of have that kind of a strong uh, architectural approach to it. So they kind of go very well. So in MicroProfile too, um, it integrates uh, with Open Liberty, you know, the, the, the decouple, decoupling, location transparency, which is kind of common for all the other libraries too. Uh, but we'll take a little quick look in here. Some example of MicroProfile reactive messaging is basically making use of the um, this uh, uh, annotations, right? And so the basically all of these your methods you annotated with incoming or outgoing, and they are all connected with one another. The different methods, you know, going through, uh, you know, the different like let's say an example of order. So you build up a channel if you kind of connect with one another using annotations, incoming and outgoing. So that this is just an example of that. And I, if you're interested, I have more examples at IBM too. We also have some labs um, that you can also practice and get used to it uh, or to learn it too. So, and now, and another uh, I brought up quickly is the R socket, the uh, reactive uh, socket. So this one is actually a binary protocol for use on byte stream 
uh, transports is highly efficient. And there are four models. You can have request and response and one to one or fire and forget, like basically fire and one to zero, you do, do not expect a response or request and stream is one request going in, you expect like many streams in the response. And then there's also channel, uh, they're bi -di directional. I think it might be covered over here. But yeah, so basically channel are bi-directional. So you kind of maintain the request and the response, like they, they uh, you maintain the state between the two during your session. So. And here, there's just a quick diagram to show you. It's something I actually um, got permission from uh, the spring, uh, you know, spring world last year. Um, our socket was there, they were promoting. And actually now too with spring, they integrate quite well with our socket as well. And Josh Long, who's the, the big reactive spring advocate from VMware, he has actually talks on that. But here, I just want to point out is, uh, you know, uh, greatly uh, supported by Reactive Foundation. And uh, basically it started by six companies, Facebook, Netify, Lightband, Alibaba Cloud, uh, VMware, back then was Pivotal, and then Vlingo. So they come together, basically, um, even now too, they are working on the R socket. It just uh, became uh, version 1.0 uh, about five months ago. And it's an open source layer five and six communication protocol based on reactive streams. Uh, so it's a bit of a lower level, uh, but it's still an application protocol. Uh, and it's 10 times faster. And it handles like uh, back pressure, uh, like streaming, resumption, cancellation. So then the actual coding, you don't need to so deal so much with some of these managing back pressure because the library itself has all those capability. And the nice thing also is that it works with um, almost like every language and platform too. And the application you can use, you know, on mobile, on edge, on IoT, uh, AI, you know, machine learning is really limitless. So, all right. Let me then quickly. There's also additional information since we're talking about streams. There's also OSGI framework, which um, some of you maybe also have familiar with. And of course, if you use the Eclipse uh, IDE, right, the editor, that's also underneath the hood is all implemented uh, using OSGI, you know, all of the, the modules, um, the libraries. So OSGI um, has its own uh, API and also basically it has, has its own uh, interface, but it implements it too, unlike the reactive streams, which is purely an interface. So, and the nice thing about push stream is that there's no need for you to, you know, to kind of pull in the other OSGI uh, frameworks to it. It's basically pretty independent except for OSGI promise. So they kind of work hand in hand with push streams and it makes use of the promise to work with, you know, data that's coming in in the future. Uh, just a quick thing to compare. Um, push streams in a sense is also support the kind of reactive way of doing things, but it's not exactly like supporting reactive streams um, because I'm also not sure if the elasticity side is explicitly being uh, supported. So if you remember the four tenants of a reactive being declared as reactive. So, but here, these are like comparison between uh, reactive streams, uh, which is Java 9 API and also the push streams. So. The one thing to note is that uh, push streams too is interesting. Um, basically the streams itself has an auto closable capability too. So you can basically process something and the streams will close, um, which whereas in uh, reactive streams, you don't uh, usually, you, you, you don't have that. It's basically subscription will kind of have to be closed by the underneath um, kind of mechanism too, rather than you explic explicitly telling it, okay, it's, you know, you can close it kind of like that. So. Now then, um, I think I have about five minutes. So let me then quickly um, um, kind of bring up my, oops, and yeah, bring up my uh, IDE here. I've been wanting to kind of show um, quickly, but um, then let me, in this case, also too, I'm also doing a live coding stream on Twitch on Wednesday. And now the time zone in Mexico is the same as Chicago. So it's like about 1230. I'll give you information if you're interested in uh, following my Twitch stream. But over here too, I started doing this about maybe two, three months ago. Um, and I've been focusing on Vertex. And the thing is with Vertex, I like to emphasize that is because Vertex is the underlying library that's supporting Quarkus. I think, um, I think Yalina Alina from uh, Oracle did a talk to, I think on Quarkus, I think, or, or maybe Grau VM, or maybe somebody in this conference or somewhere where you heard. So my colleague uh, Pratik also did, uh, has done talks to, or have been doing talks on Quarkus and of course the Red Hat folks too. Um, so that's it's a new way of doing like cloud native Java development, very efficient and everything. So underneath the hood too, um, it's, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Javier for pointing. Yeah, so 
Um, so basically, yeah, I wanted to talk about it because it's exciting. Vertex is actually very lightweight if you're not familiar with it. It, it has its own event bus and um, it, it makes use of a vertical model. It's not, uh, it's not required, but you, want, you probably do want to implement this or uh, make use of the vertical because it helps with the deployment unit. So in today's world of cloud native, it makes the deployment a lot more you know, easier for the containerization part. So anyway, this is a quick thing, right? Um, showing you how do you implement a vertical. It's actually quite um, not quite difficult, not too difficult. Of course, nothing is simple, but I don't want to like you know underemphasize or kind of saying it's too easy. But the thing is, from a coding perspective, it's not like you know you, you don't need to set up a whole lot of things. You can just do an extend um, abstract vertical. In this case, you know if you are over here, abstract vertical would should come up. Yes. So basically, two is from the vertex core package and basically an abstract base class. And so, yeah, you can also read about that now. I have my GitHub too, and, and I can point you to where my code is too. You can take a look. Um, so abstract vertical, and basically um, a start method that you override if you extend that. And so, for example, Vertex, um, it has a set periodic uh, kind of uh, call, which is kind of very handy comes in because it's like a timer, right? So you can set a periodic timer to kind of fire something, you know, every how many delay, right? So in this case, I'm like every five seconds or 5,000 milliseconds, I do a tick. And then there's also Vertex, you can create the HTTP server listener. And for every Vertex too, uh, you do want to define like a handler. In this case, this is a request handler that basically um, in this particular case, it will just print out hello and it will listen on port 8080. So that's, that's just a sample thing. But the thing is to, in order to start up your code, it's as easy as just doing a vertex, it's the controller, it's vertex dot vertex. And then basically you deploy this vertical. And that's why we suggest using a vertical because you can just deploy and basically instantiate your hello vertical. And that's how it works. Okay, so I won't go into running it because I think I look at the clock is getting late, but here too, wanting to also show a quick thing about vertex. It's actually very um, efficient in terms of doing like polyglot uh, implementation. Again, in my Twitch too, I've been talking about it. And uh, here too, like you basically, right over here, um, just now, right, when I was showing how do you deploy, you can basically write your vertical and that's like a worker I, in this particular case. Okay, I should act I actually have to go back to my uh, slide, but I will show you quickly uh, later. So over here too, it's just a, um, I, all I need to do is basically do a vertex and do a deploy vertical. And that's how you deploy your, your particular worker node. And you can deploy as many as you want. So, and, and that's the kind of beauty of it. But in this particular case, I'm just demonstrating how do you, how would you support the, the polyglots uh, like this? So, okay, so over here too, um, I, I sh should also quickly show you uh, too, is that, you know, um, in my in my code here, I do, I extend, uh, this is API. So I basically have this example is a, API vertical, it's like a gateway, simple thing, and it's extend my abstract vertical. So I have all of these things, which I don't have time to describe, but in my start, right? The start in there, I basically leverage on their config um, configuration and read in the parameters that store inside my configuration file, config.json. And then I have used the retriever and basically loaded into memory. And the nice thing about this is that um, the retriever, I can basically set a listener to it. So if there are any changes in that file, I can just quickly uh, get the information and, look and swap it, you know, swap in the new thing, swap out the old thing kind of thing. So that's, that's, that's kind of nice. So and that's what essentially is doing. And if you can see the, the start, uh, in the start too, I basically over here in my startup too, I also have to set up the router to, to handle the requests. So all of these things, and again, um, I won't have as much time to describe, but if you're interested, yeah, go to my Twitch and then we can talk more in there too. So, okay, sorry about that. And let me, um, I'll swap back my, this over here because I do have a few words to say before um, uh, before the end and uh, current slide, okay. And, okay. Okay, that I already did and uh, wait, okay. So that was the, this thing, uh, okay. Actually, this thing, Quarkus, I just want to kind of quickly point out, right? I talk about Quarkus. So Quarkus, underneath the hood is Vertex. Um, you, you won't have to deal with that, it directly because it's underneath the hood. It's basically application go through the routing layer and then it goes into Vertex that basically Vertex handle that request and response. So that's why too, it explains 
some of why like Quarkus is very efficient. And you can also blend in like this uh, reactive and declarative style of programming with uh, imperative style too. So that's another kind of pretty interesting kind of um, you know thing that you can do with uh, Quarkus. And this is again, just a quick polyglot use case. Just now when I was showing the code, I figured, well, a picture is worth a thousand words. So that was what I was trying to do. The API vertical is Java. And basically too, I'm leveraging on the vertex event bus. And basically I deploy all of these worker they're in uh, Kotlin, JavaScript, and uh, Java too. You can write Python and Scala, Clojure, you name it too. And basically too, I'm using SockJS Bridge for the JavaScript kind of connection in there. And so this is just, again, just a very simple case of demonstrating the polyglot nature of, of, of Vertex. So again, I should have shown you the picture first, but I didn't get a chance. And okay, for the ACA, I won't have time to show, but it, as we coming to an end, I realize it's almost top of the hour. So I wanted to thank you all for having sat through my talk. I hope it has been useful. I, I'm sure you have lots of questions and lots of possibilities. I love to continue to talk about Reactive. I have my own Discord uh, stream too. And also we have Chicago Jug also has a stream too. But if you follow me, scan and join my uh, stream on Discord, that's the uh, QR code quickly. And you can follow me on Twitter. That's my GitHub. My dev.2, my blog, I have yet to start doing that, and all of these other things. I'll make this available and follow us, our IBM uh, Java newsletter, and also uh, the Reactive Streams resource, but I won't stay it, stick it here. But also, wanted something to point out to you very quickly. Next week happens that I will be doing a workshop, Knative Vertex Microservices on Red Hat OpenShift. So if you can join, please, October 8th, you know, on uh, it's uh, 9.30, well, that's Pacific time. So for Chicago time or Mexico time, that's 11.30 in the morning is an hour. So you can get a taste of the Kubernetes and Knative cluster too for two days. So please scan there and join me. And um, Twitch, I already showed it to you. Thank you for posting that. And I also will be having a podcast coming up soon. And with that, it comes to an end, but I'll point it in here so you can, if you need to scan. And I hope I didn't go too, too much over time, uh, Sir. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again all for coming to my talk. Thanks a lot, Mari. That was very interesting. There was a lot of information to digest. It's very, very, very interesting, this world of reactive programming. It has a lot of things to do. Yes, exactly, exactly. And it, I think the possibilities are limited. Now, the thing, limitless. Um, the thing I wanted to point out there, folks, right, they're also with the new Java is going to come up with Project Loom. Project Loom is basically this super thread um, concept, right? And the threading will be bring threading to another level. There are folks that saying that super thread can, can kind of basically cover, you know, kind of wipe out reactive. I'm not sure yet. I think I yet to, I've yet to see, you know, because I do see the possibility in doing reactive style of programming and it's, uh, it's just nice. Yeah, so, but anyway, I thought I'd bring this up too, so. Does well, anyone have a question? Yeah. yeah, we have two questions. I think that you already answered one that was like, any comment on how Project Loom will affect reactive uh, streams on Java? Oh yeah, Javier, that's right. So I think it will. It probably will. I have not read anything yet as far as reactive streams, maybe updating it, you know, how does it work with Project Loom? I think it has, uh, we are waiting to see what will happen is, is what I'm thinking. Uh, because Project Loom, I think, is scheduled for next year or Java. I think it's Java 17 or something, from what I remember. So I could be wrong too. But yeah, let's continue also on Discord. We can talk to talk more about this. So yeah. and another question. Yeah, my those micro profile reactive streams implementation like Open Liberty are based on common uh, libraries like VertX. Yes. Yeah, so that's a very good question. You know, there's also a library called I did not say is Small Rye. Uh, Small Rye is. Um, also, an open source project is a is reactive library. So it's based on small ride, but I think a small ride too is being deprecated and replaced by mutiny. Um, so if you also want to look up mutiny, and, and like I said, I spoke with Clamon from uh, Red Hat, right? So they they do the uh, uh, the, the the vertex. So he was the one that we talk a bit on mutiny in my podcast. I will be publishing that too. So look up mutiny. Yeah, that's what uh, micro uh, yeah micro profile uses. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, Mari, thanks a lot. Uh, we have to cut yeah. out because of the time. But okay. thanks a lot. Sorry yeah. for, for the pressure, no but it yeah. was awesome to have you here. Uh, and thank thanks you. for that awesome content. Thank you, Sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, JCon Mexico. I would love to visit your country next year. Thank you. <laughs> so. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.
Bye bye. Bye. Well, we have a small break. Uh, we will get back in a few minutes.